Hi, and welcome to the End Times Bible Study. It is such an honor and a pleasure to have you joining me. And may this Bible study bring you strength, encouragement, eyes that see, ears that hear for the end times that are upon us. I want to start off by sharing something I learned over the weekend. There is a process taking place right now. It's being fronted by the United Nations and all of their various branches, as well as key industrial players and tech companies like Microsoft. And it involves local governments as well as banking institutions. This is very, very big. It's very global. And it's being developed right now. And it's called ID2020. It's something you need to be aware of. Basically, the UN in their ID2020, their initial meeting in 2016, they said that it was a human right for every person on the planet to have a digital identity of their own so that they could access government programs and be able to identify themselves and that that identification should be absolutely secure. So the United Nations, if you know anything about the organization, it's completely depraved and demonic. And this is their goal. By 2020, they want to have it not, not fully implemented, but started. And they're going to continue to meet annually to discuss developments and um, steps and procedures taken by governments, corporations, and other entities in moving towards this, what they call, quote unquote, real identity. By 2030, they fully intend to have it implemented worldwide. And I honestly don't believe it will take until 2030. For instance, Washington, the, the state on the West Coast, has uh, a countdown clock on their website that it's 10 months and 14 days as of today until you will be required to have a digital identity, a real ID to fly or to access government offices. You will need that identification. In Africa, in India, millions and millions are receiving a real ID card. It's a unified ID card that contains your passport, your driver's license, your health care, your government um, number, whether it's a um, social insurance number or your, I know what it's called in the United States, it's just eluding me, social security number, um, whatever that may be, uh, it will contain your banking information. The banks are also involved in this. One card will have all of your identity packaged in it, but it's not a card. The card is just holding the real deal. The real deal is the RFID chip embedded in the card. You'll know that it's a real ID card because it has a five-pointed star in the upper right corner. That's your symbol that this is a real genuine ID. Five-pointed star. Why a pentagram of all things that they could choose? Why a pentagram? But that is what they've chosen. But this real ID is being manifested right under our noses. And you know, if one day government of the world waited for a big catastrophe and said, everyone has to be chipped, all the sheep would go running together because they would say, this is the mark, we must run and many would be saved. They would alarm all the people around them at the same time, declaring to them emphatically, this is the mark of the beast. If you receive it, you cannot be saved. But a smart card, I've already listened to preachers saying it's a precursor to the mark of the beast. It's not actually the mark of the beast. And that has led me to contemplating today what is the significance of this mark of the beast? A mark we must receive on a right hand or forehead, and without it, you cannot buy or sell. Why is the Antichrist so interested in implementing this piece of technology? 
And we have to step back from the just the technology of it and look at it in a broader and certainly a more spiritual context. In, I believe it's Ezekiel chapter 9, God commands the angel to go through Jerusalem and mark everyone on their forehead who sighs over the wickedness taking place in that land. They are to be marked with a mark on their forehead. That's the first example of a mark on the forehead we read in scripture. Then we read of the mark of the beast. But then later in Revelation, we read again of another mark. The children of God are marked on their forehead. We bear the mark of God on our forehead. Now, all throughout pagan religions of the ancient world, marking the forehead was very widely and commonly practiced. In fact, that's where the the Catholics do their Ash Wednesday and mark their forehead with ash. That's a carryover from paganism from Rome. So marking the forehead is not something new to the end times. It's actually quite ancient. And it is denoting uh, ownership is one way of putting it. Or I think belonging is a better way of kind of encompassing the um, spirit of what this mark on the forehead entails. It's a, a distinction of belonging. Those who have the mark of God on their forehead bear it with great joy and gladness and thanksgiving because it is an emblem of their belonging to God. This mark is the emblem, I've called it a a form of circumcision, which could very well be the same thing. Um, An emblem of belonging to the Antichrist. And this makes it more easy to understand why God is emphatic. The Bible is very clear. Anyone who receives the mark of the beast cannot be saved. That's it. There's no turning back. You take the mark, you're done. It's over. You cannot be saved. You will find your uh, future in the lake of fire. There is no other way. And that makes it for me something that must be taken very, very seriously. We must not be like the Pharisees, blind and stubborn, but we must be have our hearts open and sensitive to the Holy Spirit who will lead us and guide us safely through these very, very troubling times. So let's stop for a minute thinking about the mark of the beast being implanted in our hand. Let's just consider what the mark of the beast is. It is a digital mark. We we can see clearly that it's going to be technological in nature. And it will be a sign of ownership over us. And this is where I want to kind of sort out a gray area. Because technically, you could be holding the ID card that has your driver's license, your health care, your passport, your personal identification, your uh, ability to buy and sell and all of these things in that card. And you you haven't received a mark in your forehead or or right hand. Therefore, you have not breached what the scriptures say. And that's exactly how the Pharisees would approach this. And that's why I'm suggesting we take a step back from it and see if Satan has one way of laying claim upon us and putting his mark on us, his, his assertion of ownership that we belong to him. If he can do it with the implant in our hand, can he do it in other ways? We have to wake up and smell the the coffee. The, The Antichrist is brilliant. Lucifer is described as perfect in beauty and filled with all knowledge. If we're going to get deceived, he can do it. And Jesus said, even the elect will be deceived if that were possible. We need now more than ever to be listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, because I personally believe churches are going to go along with the ID card rather than fighting it. Um, Religiously declaring that it's not the implant described in Revelation 
therefore it's not the same thing but it is truly the same thing the the chip that will be placed under your skin is the chip in that card so what else is attached to that chip well it everything in your life is attached to it and this is what i want you to consider it is the creation of a digital identity and one um scholar stated that it was the equivalent of having a digital version of you created so i want you to consider for a moment what it means to be born again at the moment of conversion when the power of god moves into your life you are born in the spiritual realm a version of you is now alive and existing in heavenly places seated with christ right now and i sure hope that's your experience as it is mine the thrill and the joy of being seated in heavenly places a part of me cannot be touched or harmed by anything the enemy does i am with christ i am in christ and that happened at the moment of conversion now we know that satan loves to mimic the things of god and i really honestly believe the mark of the beast isn't so much about the tiny device as it is about being born into his kingdom which is a technocratic kingdom and if a part of us is uh, brought into existence within his kingdom it kind of mimics being born again and i'm looking at it and i'm saying no no digital id for me thanks because I'll be honest with you. I'll be blunt here. You can take that card and maybe have a couple of, I guarantee you, no more than a couple of years of life as normal. But it will be a very, very short time between receiving that card and then realizing that it's too much of you to be set down, to be misplaced, to be lost. It was reckless to suggest that we could just have a card this is too important, too critical to your life to be misplaced. We have to place it under your skin as they're doing with um, convicts and inmates. And uh, in Sweden, people are willingly taking it for the convenience of it all. And all of this is being um, packaged by the United Nations and Microsoft and everyone involved as a human right. We have the right to a digital identity. And gosh darn it, all these associations and organizations and business interests are so kind they're doing it for our benefit if you listen to them everywhere you go you hear the same propaganda they're doing this for us i guarantee you if you take that card you've got a couple of years at most to live a normal life and continue to buy and sell but it, it's going to be a very short period of time between the card and the implant so think pray about it seek the lord i'm not the the final word on spiritual matters i'm just as prone to making mistakes as anyone else and i could very well be wrong but for me this is where i draw the line in the sand no digital identity for me and i suspect i will have a couple of years of learning to live without access to society we have homeless people in every community who are surviving and I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from them. And <laughs> you see how stupid, how, how nutty I sound in saying that? And that's exactly what Satan wants. And many, many good people will be deceived. They will think, well, God doesn't want us to <laughs> live on the streets. Well, each one of us has a choice to make. And we're choosing based on our own eternal soul. And that's why I want everyone to be aware of ID 2020 and the push that's taking place. Leviathan is being, uh, has been created underneath our feet for a very long time. It's now starting to rise to the surface. And I'll tell you what, its tentacles reach across the world. So be warned, you know, gather knowledge, gain knowledge. Um, don't be fooled. Don't be asleep. Now is not the time. Tonight, we're continuing our Bible study in chapter 18 of Revelation. 
It's going to be a bit of a longer read. We're covering from verse 9 all the way to verse 20 because it's kind of a theme. And this theme that we're covering tonight in this passage of Scripture has led many people to believe that America is Babylon the Great. And just in the research I've done, I can say pretty emphatically that's not the case. But I can see why, and you'll see why as we read through the scripture, why some have drawn that conclusion. So um, beginning in verse 9, we're continuing our forensic investigation, digging into Babylon, mystery Babylon, the great harlot, the mother of harlots. Who is she? Let's break every bit of of, uh, information apart, dig all the clues out we can, analyze them, and make as informed a decision as possible. When we've covered these scriptures, I'm going to do a master list and go through all the different possibilities and score them and see if one stands out as being uniquely qualified to be called Babylon the Great. So beginning in verse 9, And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citrion wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. The fruit you long for has gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, For in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor, and as many as make their living by the sea, stood at a distance, and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city! in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the phrase of weeping, lamenting, and mourning, which occurs in verse 9, verse 11, verse 15, verse 18, and verse 19. When something is repeated a second time in Scripture, historically, that is the, uh, uh, that's akin to yelling it. And if it's stated a third time, that is an over-the-top scream. To have something repeated in five different passages is kind of unsettling. There is definitely something being conveyed in that. The weeping, the lamenting, the mourning being told over and over and over um, paints the picture of absolute horror. Like we are just not familiar with an atrocity that dwarfs some of the worst things that have happened in the last hundred years. It's going to be horrific. Verse 10 is actually rich with clues. We know that the destruction happens in one hour. That's repeated again later. In one hour. Which leads me to believe this isn't gunfire. This isn't artillery. This isn't bombs being dropped. This is a nuclear devastation. We read over and over again. They watch at a distance. And we see that also in verses 10 verse 15 and verse 17 
standing at a distance. They won't get close to it. And that suggests also a nuclear bomb. The city is destroyed in one hour. Nukes would do that. People are afraid to get close. Nukes would do that. That's just hypothesis. I'm not stating anything emphatically. And also in verse 10, it's declared to be a strong city. A very good clue for us. We have to honestly and fairly evaluate every city. Mecca, I'm thinking Beijing needs to be on the list. And... Uh, London and all the different cities we're going to look at, uh, you know, it is a strong city. It is an incredibly wealthy city. As we read all of the cargoes that we're reading of in verses 12 and 13, they're not common cargoes. They're expensive. Um, two of them were the things that the wise men brought to Jesus to celebrate his birth. Frankincense. There's incense. Um, you know, the, the cargoes that are being bought by the city aren't your everyday television sets, Ken, Kenmore washing machines. This is high end, very high end stuff. So the city is extravagantly wealthy. We have to keep that in mind as we begin to score various cities. And the final thing I want to bring out is in verse 20, and it's kind of out of out of place, out of character with the rest of the passage we've read, because now it's no longer talking about her and her destruction that, remember, what we covered last Bible study, she brought it on herself. What she dished out, she's receiving back. Her torment is a repayment of the torment that she has issued to the many. And in verse 20, rejoice over her, saints and apostles and prophets. This is saying, children of God, celebrate. Children of God, dance. Children of God, lift up your voices and rejoice. Because God has judged her on your account. And this really makes it clear. She is a tormentor of the saints. These are all really strong clues. And I think by the end, we're going to be able to look at some possibilities. Um, in some cases, removing them as I'm almost positive now, America will be removed from the list because this is the only passage that draws our attention to the United States. And logistically, the United States can't be destroyed in an hour. It simply can. A city can be a country I, don't, I can't even think of a country small enough. I'm sure there's one out there, but uh, to be destroyed in one hour is remarkable. There are so many rural areas across America, um, you know, and it says quite clearly, uh, as we'll read tomorrow night, her, her condemnation ceases every kind of life in the city. And we'll read that tomorrow night. Thank you so much for joining me. God bless and keep you all.